ESPN presents Major League Baseball Magazine. This week's cover story, the stories behind the stories of the 1961 Yankees. His nerves were so bad that big pieces of hair was coming out of his head. We'll travel to Pittsburgh and show you what the fine art of ballet has to do with baseball. There are a lot of people who wouldn't be caught dead at a ballet who are coming to see this. And we'll show you the more seedy side of the game, where players in the dugout just love to take aim. Oh, I see. They're trying to hit the third base coach. They're after Gene Lamont. This is Warner Fusell for Major League Baseball Magazine. Two outs, nobody on. There it is. There it is. If it stays fair, and it is number 60. The most celebrated moment from the Yankees' 61 season came when Roger Maris broke Babe Ruth's record with 61 home runs. But there are other facts about the 61 Yankees that are often overlooked. For instance, although Maris and Mantle were in a home run race for most of the season, Maris didn't hit his first home run until April 26th. Even more bizarre was what didn't happen to Maris the entire season. I think Mickey really set up uh, Roger's entire year hitting the 61 home runs. Roger had hit the home runs, but because Mickey started off so quickly, Roger kind of faltered along the way. They just wouldn't pitch to uh, Mickey the rest of the year batting fourth. They would rather pitch to Roger, and I guess that's one of the great trivia questions. Roger Maris didn't get one, uh, one intentional walk that entire year. Almost lost in the home run shuffle was what pitcher Whitey Ford accomplished in the month of June. For some reason, I pitched the first day of June and was able to have eight starts in one month, which, you know, is unheard of. Uh, you know, he figures 30 days in a month and to get eight starts, and I think I won all eight of them. Whitey did, in fact, win all eight and posted the quietest 25-4 and four record of all time. But that's because the 61 Yankees' propensity for the long ball captured the fans' imagination. They hit a record 240 home runs that year, but few remember just how many were hit by their platooning catcher. Don't you away, and here's Elston Howard, leading both leagues in hitting. Elston Howard. Two out, nobody on, no score, top of the second. The Yankees and the White Sox from Comiskey Park in Chicago. Now the 2-1 pitch is a drive deep to left field. That ball is gone way back. That was. He was talking about being spoiled. Now that's what you call spoiled. Our catchers hit 60 home runs that year. Nobody knows that either, I don't think. Uh, Elston Howard hit over 20. Johnny Blanchard hit a 20 or more. And Yogi hit over 20. But catchers were an afterthought as Madeline Maris went head to head into September. There goes Tony, and there's a high. in the first inning, struck out twice since, coming up. Swung on, that's a high drive to deep right field. Look out now, K-Line, he is not going to get it, a home run! Number 50. With Ruth's record in sight of both men, Mantle dropped from the running and the spotlight with a debilitating injury, leaving the shy Roger Maris to handle the suffocating pressure alone. They would put a U-shaped pattern around his locker. And there were literally towards the end there, there was anywhere from 25 to 35 writers around him. Well, the lockers have got a, a wire mesh, you know. And the guys would be in my locker asking him questions through the screen. Well, you know, so I, I was the only ball player in the ball club that had a confessional. 
Roger, all of a sudden, is thrown right in the middle of all this publicity and everything. He was, his nerves were so bad that big pieces of hair was coming out of his head, you know. It was just, it was unbelievable. I was losing hair and all that other stuff, you know, so uh, I think I, uh, I was going through a lot of mental strain without really realizing what was happening. It was just, it, it snuck up on me. One day we're in Baltimore and somebody said, Gee, you, you know, you got a, a lot of hair missing in the back of your head. Well, I can't see back there, so I didn't know. And uh, I think it was just a lot of strain coming on that I really wasn't aware of. He did, of course, do it. And years before it was fashionable, made perhaps the first recorded curtain call. Then you got a handful of people sitting out in left field, but in right field, man, it is mobbed out there. And they're standing up. Here's the windup. Fastball hit deep to right. That's going to be it. I played uh, 16 years. I really never, ever saw anybody get a standing ovation. And it was something that, uh, to me, when I came in, I, you know, I, I did my job. Uh, I hit the 60. I was fortunate enough to hit the 61. I was just doing my job. It was all in line of duty, so I really didn't feel it was anything special that I should go jump out in the field and tip my hat and throw my hands up. And when I came in, of course, the people kept clapping, clapping. The guys trying to push me out of the dugout, and I was embarrassed to go out there. You know, here I am, all these people. You know, and you, I, it was really I was embarrassed to go out there. Meanwhile, Whitey Ford continued to labor in the shadows, and after Maris took care of Ruth with the bat, Whitey took aim at the Babe's World Series pitching record of 29 and two thirds consecutive scoreless innings. But that was the best kept secret in baseball. Uh, about the fifth inning, I didn't know it, but I had broken a record. And I was coming off the mound in Cincinnati, and a lot of people got up and started applauding. And I didn't know why, because not many people applauded for uh, the Yankees in Cincinnati. And uh, I realized that a couple of the players in the dugout knew about it, and they shook hands. And I, then I realized what it was, but it was a pretty well-kept secret. But for Sal Durante of Brooklyn, who caught Roger's 61st home run, the real drama didn't begin till after the season. It was obvious that we had to, we had to get that baseball. It was obvious that we had to identify it. You know, we were going to make something of this, of this event. They wouldn't let me take the ball out of Yankee Stadium. Okay. And so I agreed to put my initials on the baseball. And that's the way I left it until I went to Sacramento to meet Roger. And uh, we did a publicity stunt there. He was supposed to meet me in Sacramento and exchange the ball. The restaurant owner would give me the 5000 I would give him the ball, and in turn, he'd give Maris the ball as a gift. Restaurateur Sam Gordon ensured that Maris got the home run ball. And I'm going to present this ball to you, Roger making you a gift of this ball for you to do with it as you see fit for your own personal memoirs or to put in the Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It was a fitting end to the Yankees' 61 season. Roger got the ball and the glory, and Sal picked up the check. It has to be the happiest day of my life. Clean lines were put. In the news, the subtle spark that lives inside a player and enables him to pass the time. That's what you do when you're not playing. You try to keep your sanity is what you do. Randy Tomlin joining Mike LaVallier. Well, Mike hits left-handed. Randy throws left-handed. Left-handers do things like that never find right-handed guys do things that crazy. Oh, I see. They're trying to hit the third base coach. They're after Gene Lamont. He's going to take his dust buster out there next inning. See, they didn't think of that when they put the dugouts closer to the field. Now, what do you do between advance? I try to do whatever. 
since told my teammates my best friends. Right? <laughs> well, left-handers are a little different, right? That's six foot ten inch Randy Johnson. That's what's known as a rubber arm. A rubber arm. Do you hit any differently on the road than you do in Boston? Do you? approach the pitch any different oh! <laughs> <laughs> looks like some of those paid assassins got it uh, joe i'm not sure that we know who those were we, we didn't get any license plate numbers on this that's wade boggs ladies and gentlemen uh, a surprise attack and uh, we want to thank wade boggs for being with us uh, we're going to find out who that was maybe we can get a replay on that one and slow oh look at this just by coincidence well there's, coincidence. there's greenwell that's Brunanski, the first one in. There's Bruno. And that's Steve Lyons, psycho himself, and back in the background, the first one out of the dugout, Mike Greenwell. <laughs> Take your pick, fastball or a slider. Ten finger Johnson, they call it, right? <laughs> Some players get to laugh on the field, but only one gets to laugh at Dad. Left field, and another long run for Griffey Sr. near the line. Good catch. And another chuckle from Jr. in center field. He's having, he's having a good time watching his dad do all the running. Oxygen tank will be out in the locker room after the hit. Yeah. He wants time. <laughs> Give my dad a little time to catch his breath. This is Casey from the Pittsburgh Ballet's production of Casey at the Bat, a program designed for children. One of the board members of Performing Arts for Children submitted it as a possible idea on a list of many ideas, along with Star Wars and Superman and things like that. And when I saw Casey, I thought, I could do something with this. And I think a lot of people thought I was crazy, but I thought it was perfect for a ballet. I mean, the movement is right there. So I didn't see a problem. But accuracy was a problem. So the ballet got Pirates first base coach, Tommy Sant, to teach the nuances of baseball. Basically, I just try to show them the stance and, and the swing uh, you know, of a baseball player. And I, the, the hardest part was, in baseball, you never want to point your feet out. And in ballet, you do point your feet out. So we had to correct that right off the bat. And then we went into pitching, a little bit of pitching form, and then how to catch the ball. See, as you when you take your stride there, your your hips come, you're coming like this. You don't want to do that until you swing. Good. That, that's pretty fast. <laughs> the key to fill in is have your hands out in front of you on a ground ball. Alright? You don't want to get back in here. Alright. You want to catch the ball out here. In order to do that, you've got to bend your knees a little bit and get your rear end down. But you're not sitting down. You're not catching it like this. Okay, well, All right. Well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once they got past spring training on the stage, Brian Bloomquist stole the spotlight as the mighty Casey. Right away, as soon as uh, we knew we were going to do Casey, I cast Brian Bloomquist as the first cast of Casey himself. Uh, a lot because of his height and his demeanor. He's a very good dancer, and he's got this great chin. <laughs> and I saw Casey as being very stoic and tall and muscular and, and uh, larger than life. The ballet looks back at the Mudville Nine's famous game and, of course, Casey's celebrated strikeout. But in this game, Strikeouts and statistics give way to pas de deux and encores. expected it to come out as well as it did. I, I, I knew it would be fun, but it really, really has taken off. Um, in fact, there are a lot of people who wouldn't be caught dead at a ballet who are coming to see this. So we're really pleased. <laughs> well, I thought it was very good. Uh, uh, 
you know, they looked, uh, it looked like they took everything we talked about and put it into application, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And my first ballet, and I thought that was awesome. We present this week Bill Crabe and Sue Essler in the first installment of the Baseball Travelogue, a summer-long odyssey in which Bill and Sue will visit every major and minor league park in the country and, armed with their camera, will keep us abreast of their travels. Basically what we're going to be doing from here, we go to a game in Reno tomorrow, work our way through the California League um, during the early part of April, uh, down through the desert southwest, through Phoenix and Tucson, Colorado Springs, um, from there into the Texas League, uh, by the middle of May into the Florida State League, and then up the East Coast. Um, by the end of the summer, we will work our way out to the Midwest and the West Coast, and at the end of the year, we will have seen 178 professional baseball games in each of their parks. We have a Plymouth Voyager, a brand new one. Uh, we'll, we're going to be spending a lot of time camping, eating fast food. My parents were a little nervous at first on how I was going to live, but they think it's a wonderful opportunity for me to see the country. They began their ballpark journey in April. Already, Bill and Sue have come to realize that the minor league parks have a certain Norman Rockwell charm that you just don't find on the major league trail. Ashman Field is unlike a lot of the parks that we've seen so far this year. Obviously, it's different because it's the AAA park, but it's also different because it's just one of the more well-laid-out stadiums that we've been to. Featured in Bakersfield, California, the country's only indoor park playground. So keep watching for more of Bill and Sue's excellent baseball adventure. And now it's time for the Upper Deck Stat of the Week. Nobody does baseball like Upper Deck. Ricky Henderson always seems to turn up at Nolan Ryan's important events, even if he doesn't really want to be there. Ricky Henderson will be in the record books as strikeout number 5,000. Again, the 0-2 pitch. Even when Ricky passed Lou Brock, he was done one better by Nolan. As long as Ricky's around, Ryan's name lives on. Announcers will, at some point, mention every player in a game. But it's the rare player indeed who gets the privilege of being mentioned for an entire inning. Murray is in uh, the driver's seat right now. Advantage Murray, 3-1 pitch on the ground, Robbie Thompson. Playing him perfectly, and Murray is retired. You know, look at the play that Robbie makes. It looks like a real easy play, and it is. But the reason that it was such an easy play for Robbie, he knew that Murray was the hitter. He knows something about Eddie Murray. Looking for a ball he can pull or hit out of the ballpark. So when Kelly was behind the count three and one, Robbie was playing Murray to pull. Now there's a ball hit in the hole. Easy play for him. But it just, it just looked like a routine play. And yet it won because that ball was in the hole between first and second. He put himself in the position, so it was a routine play. That's right. Little subtle things like that that sometimes you don't see out there in the field. If you're smart, it can make your job a lot easier. And this to Robbie Thompson. This will be a tougher play. And he got him by a step. Good, strong arm. Robbie Thompson, and that's out number two. All right, now, with Murray, he knows he's going to pull the ball. Cal Daniels.
Daniels is not Error. a full hitter. Cal Daniels hits the ball back up the middle. Where's Robbie Thompson? <laughs> right there to throw him out. He's all over the place. That's right. Look at the range that Thompson has demonstrated on two ground balls. One in the hold at first. This one back up the middle. I think the only second baseman in the league that might be better than Robbie is Ryan Sandra. And that's because of the offense. And Robbie might even admit to that. Defensively, I don't think so. I think Jose, Jose Lead is much more spectacular, but that doesn't mean that he's any better. And I really believe Robbie is the best at turning the double play. Yeah, there's nobody the better. And this could be Robbie Thompson in four three on all three putouts here in the sixth inning. Two one Giants here in the top of the seventh inning. And this indeed was the Robbie Thompson inning. Well, one was to his left. Robbie. Look how close he is to playing first base. Second base. Then the one back up the middle off of Cal Daniels. Took the high hop from the grass. Guns him down. This one, the Robbie Thompson. Nice goal. Many times during the course of the season, someone will make an outstanding defensive play and then lead the inning off. In this particular case, Robbie made three plays. All of them looked routine and easy, and two of them took some breaks. He's coachable. You know? See, now, if he were to really do it, he'd get a base hit. He would before if he did. This is Hollywood. When you're on the cue, you're supposed to take advantage of it. 2 1 pitch. On the ground, and he's 4 for 4. I watched Fred Butler when Thompson got the hit. Really? Went in, shook his head, put his hands on his hips. 4 for 4 for Robbie Thompson. You know, we should give Robbie a, uh, a copy of this tape. <laughs> We've been talking about him yeah. so much. Nobody does baseball like Upper Deck. Find one of 2,500 personally signed Nolan Ryan cards hidden in random packs. Listen to my nephew. He's going to be a lawyer like me. He's even going to look like me. Oh, really? Does that mean on his first big trial day, the jury's going to notice his winning smile? Yeah. And his great suit. Yeah. Oh, his little flakes. No, dandruff? Me? Oh, it's going to happen to perfect people. Here, just use my shampoo. On deck for next week... A variation on a theme. Rex Sawyer hits an easy ground to the shortstop, but the shortstop is stopped short. This is Warner Fusell. Promotional considerations furnished by United Airlines, together with United Express, serving over 200 cities in the U.S. and around the world. Come fly the friendly skies. And by Major League Baseball home videos. Call 1-800-328-8500 to order your copy of Major League Baseball's Greatest Plays.